Welcome to Making Houston Modern, the life and architecture of Howard Barnstow. I'm Jim Parsons, Programs Director for Preservation Houston. There's been a great response to this program. I can see that we have about 250 people watching right now, and that number is going up all the time. Uh, it includes several family members and friends of Howard Barnstone, and I think that shows the impact that Barnstone had on Houston and the interest that there still is in his life and work. Tonight's program has proven so popular that some of you may be watching from a live stream that we've posted to YouTube. However you're joining us tonight, welcome. Preservation Houston's happy to be co-sponsoring tonight's program with Architecture Center Houston and Houston Mod. I want to say a quick word about all three organizations. Architecture Center Houston cultivates public appreciation for architecture and its effect on the human experience through design-focused programming. ARCH offers architectural tours, K-12 educational programs, community events, lectures, film programs, and exhibitions. After a three-year post-Harvey rebuilding project, ARCH will be moving into its new home on Commerce Street in downtown Houston this fall. The inaugural exhibition for the new Architecture Center is Houston 2020 Visions, a collaboration between the City of Houston, AIA, and ARCH conceived as a creative way to address the challenges of disaster and response with a focus on urban design and planning. You can learn more about that exhibition at Houston2020visions.org, and you can learn more about Architecture Center Houston at AIAHouston.org. Houston Mod is a nonprofit membership-based organization dedicated to promoting knowledge and appreciation of modern architecture and design in Houston and across Texas. To advocate for the preservation of this cultural legacy, Houston Mod presents a variety of programs, publications, tours, and other events for members in the general public. You can learn more about Houston Mod at HoustonMod.org. And Preservation Houston is Houston's only citywide historic preservation, education, and advocacy nonprofit. Since 1978, we have voiced strong support for better public policy and protection of our irreplaceable historic resources. And we continue to advocate on behalf of our historic buildings, neighborhoods, and landscapes, and educate Houstonians about their history and architecture through programs, publications, and tours. You can learn more about us at preservationhouston.org. All three organizations are keeping up with programs even in the days of Zoom and social distancing. We're all gonna be offering things that I think you'll be interested in in the coming weeks and months. So please make sure to visit the websites you see listed here. Also uh, follow the organizations on social media so that you don't miss anything that's coming up. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, a preservationist, author, and architectural historian who was an early member of Preservation Houston and is also a past executive director of AIA Houston. Please help me welcome Barry Bradley. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jim. And hello, everybody out there. I wish I could see you. First, I do, on behalf of all of, the, all of the speakers, I want to extend a huge thanks to the co-sponsors. We really appreciate them promoting the book and helping us get the word out, uh, especially Jim Parsons, who was the first person to approach us about doing this program. Uh, we also appreciate all of you out there watching and for caring about Houston's mid-century architect, modern architecture, Howard Barnstone, and historic preservation. As a bonus for your participation tonight, we will be showing some images and telling a few stories that are not in the book. So, and we will look forward to your questions. We also want to give a shout out to the University of Texas Press and our editor, Robert Devins, and others on his staff who helped make this book not only a reality, but a beautiful one at that. If you don't have a copy of Making Houston Modern yet, you can order it from Brazos Bookstore at brazosbookstore.com. They will mail it to you or bring it to you in their parking lot. It's also available at all the usual places, including the University of Texas Press website. Uh, and we hope we can plan a big celebration in the new Architecture Center Houston when COVID has finally been vanquished and you can bring your books then and we will all be there to sign them. And for tonight's program, we will review, I am going to review the biographical details of Howard Barnstone's life. Michelangelo Sabatino will discuss Barnstone and Mies van der Rohe and Stephen Fox who worked for Howard will sum up by talking about Howard's late projects. Howard Barnstone. Howard was a brilliant bon vivant, a remarkable architect, an exceedingly complex person. When Michelangelo Sabatino was on the architecture faculty at the University of Houston, he heard so many stories about Howard, whom he'd never met, that it was he who proposed this book. Stephen Fox, rightly so, was Michelangelo's first recruit. 
The late Bill Stern was another early cheerleader and proposed author. In the course of several years, others came and went as enthusiasm and other commitments waxed and waned. In the summer of 2014, several people who were interested, including me, got together to decide how to move forward. And so we began. Bruce Webb was at the meeting and keen on writing about Howard in the University of Houston. Michelangelo had already written an article on Howard's Miesian architecture and wanted to expand that. And I wanted to explore Howard's relationship with the Meniles. And Stephen agreed to, what seemed, to do whatever seemed to be missing. Some others bowed out, but we had a beginning. Fortunately, we were able to bring on board other knowledgeable authors. Kate Holliday to talk about Howard in terms of uh, contemporary Texas architecture, Howard's nephew and his wife, Robert and Deborah Asher Barnstone, both architects, to write about the buildings Howard designed for his family and for himself. Josh Furman to write about Howard and his Jewish clients, and Olive Hershey, who is writing a biography of Gertrude Barnstone, to discuss their stormy marriage and Gertrude's influence on Howard's work. We're also pleased that Houston architect Carlos Jimenez agreed to do a forward, and modern architecture preservationist Theodore Proudhon and afterward. I love this picture of Howard. It reminds me of how he looked when I knew him uh, for the last few years of his life. Um, he always had a twinkle in his eye. Howard was born in a hospital in Lewiston, Maine, across the river from his parents' home in Auburn. His mother, Doris Ida Limpert, called Dora, and his father, Robert Carl Barnstone, were married in 1914 when they were 20 and 21, respectively. Her parents, Sarah Halperin and Michael Limpert, were Polish Jews who immigrated to the United States in 1888 and settled in Auburn. Howard's paternal grandfather, a Boston-born son of Ru Russian Jews, was a tailor who changed their surname from Bornstein to Barnstone in 1912. Howard was the second of three children. Beatrice, his older sister, was called Beatsy, and she was born in 1915. Howard, called Howie, was born in 23, 1923, and Willis, called Willie, was born in 1927. Dora, Robert, and their children lived with their parents in a huge Victorian house in Auburn from the time of their marriage until 1929 when they moved to New York City. Although he was only six when the family moved to New York, for the rest of his life, Howard maintained that he was from Maine and never mentioned uh, that he spent most of his childhood and his teenage years in New York City. He also never used or revealed his middle name. It took some research to find out that it was Leonard. The Barnstone's first New York apartment was at 54 Riverside Drive on the Upper West Side, where many upper middle class Jewish families lived. <clears throat> Howard's father was a wholesale jeweler with his own firm on Maiden Lane, at the time the center of New York's jewelry district. In 1935, they moved to a larger, more upscale apartment seen here at 175 Riverside Drive by J.E.R. Carpenter. Uh, it was between 89th and 90th, and it accommodated the family plus two female servants. With great views, this building overlooked the Hudson River and Riverside Park, directly across from the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. Howard attended New York public schools, including PS 166, from first through eighth grades, which was around the corner from his apartment building. The school, recently renovated for the second time, is a New York City landmark for its architecture and for its prominent alumni, including Jonas Salk, J.D. Salinger, Richard Rogers, and of course, Howard. PS 166 is one of the most impressive public schools in the city, academically and architecturally. The, the view seen here is from the 1937 program for Howard's uh, graduation, and uh, so it was contemporary. It's how it looked when he went there. Howard entered Amherst College in 1942 after he graduated from high school during World War II. But after only a year at Amherst, he enlisted in the Navy as a Lieutenant JG. He was able to transfer to the Naval Reserve Station in New Haven, allowing him to enter Yale, where he earned his bachelor's degree in 1944, and he was on active duty in the Mediterranean after that from 1944 to 1946. He returned to Yale and earned a bachelor's degree at Yale in 1948. 
The picture on the right was published with a caption about Yale architecture students, of which Howard was one, who were working on a project in Westport, Connecticut. Howard was given the choice of a thesis advisor between Louis Kahn and Edward Durrell Stone. Both men were in their mid 40s, but Kahn was a new faculty member at Yale and he had not yet designed the buildings for which he later became famous, such as the Yale Art Gallery, the Salk Institute in La Jolla and Fort Worth's Kimball Museum completed in 1966. Stone, on the other hand, had designed modern buildings, including the Museum of Modern Art that were receiving notice. His captivating international style houses such as the Goodyear House on Long Island and the Mandel House in Westchester County were widely published. Stone was also said to have had a particularly genial personality. That Khan was a Jewish Estonian immigre may also have led Barnstone away from him. Barnstone spent his life torn between his own Jewishness and his desire to escape that culture into a society of beautiful, successful, and cosmopolitan people. Howard passed the Connecticut licensing exam shortly after graduation. And because Connecticut did not require an internship to be licensed, he was a full-fledged architect when he set out to celebrate by driving across the United States in the summer of 1948. He stopped over to visit relatives in Houston and his mother's cousin, Celia Cohen Fink, took him out to tour the new architecture school at the University of Houston, established just three years earlier in 1945. Richard Lilliet, the program director, offered the impressive young Yale graduate a job right there on the spot. And Howard accepted, intending to stay a year or two, then move back to Maine and become a regional architect there. But as we know, he fortunately never left Houston. Bruce Webb's chapter covers Howard and the architecture school at the U of H, his influence on the school and his influence on the students there. As you can see on the left, on the right, the, I don't know my left from my right, the architecture classrooms and studios were haphazardly located on the small campus until the so-called buildings X, Y, and Z were built in 1955. But when Howard arrived, students worked at small, cumbersome folding desks, and some were dressed like faculty members in ties and rolled up shirt sleeves. Uh, these images illustrate Howard's relationships with his peers and his fellow faculty members. He and his wife Gertrude entertained often, especially when a renowned architect such as Buckminster Fuller was in town. Barnstone organized a speaker series at the U of H, and with the backing of his major client and friend, John DeManiel, he was able to bring prominent architects from all over the country to Houston. As you will note from these photographs, there no, were no prominent, there were no women at all, not prominent or unprominent, no women on the faculty at the time, nor apparently were any women architects invited to speak at U of H. Barnstone's best friend was Burdett Keelan. They officed together for a time, taught together, and Burdett was the executor of Howard's estate. Howard met the beautiful actress Gertrude Levy at the Contemporary Arts Association probably in 1949. They claimed an instant attraction to each other, but did not marry until 1955 when they eloped one random Saturday afternoon when they said they had nothing else to do. Marty Merritt of Houston Mod identified Howard's convertible as a 1959 Renault Floride. Clearly Howard's Floride was just the sort of cool any self-respecting mid-century modern architect would drive. Howard was sort of obsessed with cars for the rest of his life. Um, and it was really fun to drive around with him in the summer heat. He would leave the air conditioning on full blast with either the top down or all the windows rolled down. Olive Hershey contributed an insightful chapter on Howard and Gertrude's relationship. She described them as, quote, two fearless, unconventional thinkers, two intellectual rebels. They were compatible not merely because they were creative, handsome, liberal, and Jewish, they were drawn to each other because both were laced with contradictions that made sparks fly, unquote. They were also very competitive with each other. And these contradictions often turned into conflict. In September, 1965, Look Magazine published a lengthy article called A Lady Stirs Her City's Conscience. That focused completely on, on Gertrude's work on the Houston School Board to racially integrate the local public schools. 
Howard was mentioned barely as a local architect in photographs of the family, including this bike riding scene on North Boulevard near their house was published, but Gertrude was the star. There are a number of family stories in the book, but one that is not involved toilet paper. Gertrude bought toilet paper with multicolored flowers printed all over it and installed it in the powder room before one of their famous parties. This sent Howard, a purist who only approved of white toilet paper, and I think probably white everything else, into a rage. He instructed carpenters who were then making repairs to the house to nail the powder room door shut, and they did. Gertrude and Howard divorced in 1968 during one of Howard's more severe bipolar episodes, an affliction that interfered with his work and his relationship more than a few times. Making Houston Modern has a chapter on each of Howard's primary client groups. Liberal Jewish People, written by Joshua Furman. The projects Howard designed for the Barnstone family and for his own investment purposes. Uh, and that was written by his nephew, Robert, and his wife, Deborah Barnstone. And I wrote a chapter on his relationship with John and Dominique de Menil, from whose influence Howard received by far the most commissions. He essentially became the in-house architect for the Menils and for Schlumberger, which was Dominique Schlumberger de Menil's family company for which Howard headed a major division. The Menil House, designed by Philip Johnson in 1951, was one of Houston's most distinctive modern houses. Johnson stepped out of the picture once the house was completed and Howard Barnstone took over as the fixer. From 1950 to 1975, Howard made minor alterations, supervised repairs, and even designed and installed the Menil's Christmas decorations. And Brown says he also wrapped all their presents for their friends and family. Other Menil-related projects included a design of the Summer's Day campus camps in Latin America, alterations and additions to townhouses and offices in New York City, as well as work for Schlumberger's associates and Menil family houses in Houston and elsewhere. Howard's relationship with the Menils and Schlumberger allowed him to live a fast-paced, high-style life that he loved. He sometimes traveled with them, including to Montreal in 1967, to see the World's Fair, the picture here. If you're wondering who Fred Hughes is, he was Andy Warhol's business partner and he ran the whole Warhol show. He was from Houston and was a graduate of the University of St. Thomas. Dominique also had a very close relationship and friendship with Warhol. As you will learn from Michelangelo, some of Howard's best work sprang from his admiration for the work of Mies van der Rohe but he never had a personal relationship with Mies. He did, on the other hand, work with and have a high regard for Philip Johnston. Bolton and Barnstone were the associate architectural firm at the behest of John de Menil for the remarkable campus of the University of St. Thomas designed by Philip Johnson. And in the 1980s, after Johnson embraced postmodernism, so did Howard. The Rothko Chapel, the most famous building associated with Barnstone and Aubrey, was completed during one of Howard's severe breakdowns, and he readily admitted that he had little or nothing to do with it. Philip Johnson had designed an octagonal chapel for the south end of the St. Thomas Academic Mall, but it did not meet with the approval of the Basilian Fathers, the Menils, or most vehemently, Mark Rothko. After further falling out with the St. Thomas administration, the Menils donated a nearby site and hired Howard to design their chapel. The long saga is recounted in the book, but the short version is that Aubrey took over, based his design on the Johnson Chapel footprint, and hired Johnson as a consultant on the design of the entrance. The idea of the chapel went from a Roman Catholic collegiate chapel to a non-sectarian space that has become world-renowned. But Johnson actually may have had the last word when his final Houston project became the Chapel of St. Basil at the north end of St. Thomas Mall, completed in 1997. Howard's partner, Jean Aubrey, and many others have observed that publication of the Galveston that was could be Howard's most important cultural contribution to Texas and perhaps beyond. His book awakened an appreciation of Galveston's remarkable 19th century architecture and stimulated the historic preservation movement there. It may seem contradictory that a modern architect of Howard's sensibility would fall in love with the aged, decrepit buildings of Galveston, but 
Howard had spent his first six years living in the house of his grandparents here on the right in Auburn, Maine, and he visited often as he grew up. Galveston must have awakened in him a strong nostalgia for this 19th century architecture. The beautiful and soulful photographs he chose to include from two great photographers give this volume a gravitas that goes beyond geography and even architecture. Again, John Dimoniel through the Museum of Fine Arts Houston supported Howard with financial backing for the book and engaged his personal friend, Henri Cartier-Bresson, to do some of the photographs. Howard's second monograph was on the work of Houston's leading country house architect, John F. Staub, who came to Houston in 1921 as an associate of Harry T. Lindeberg, who was designing houses for Houston's oil elite in Shadyside. Staub, a gentleman and an architect of considerable talent with an MIT architectural degree, decided to remain in Houston. Houston's upper income residents recognized his talent and he designed remarkable houses for many of them in Broad Acres, River Oaks, and other upscale neighborhoods. Howard, who could have designed and built his own modern house, instead chose to live in Staub's Copley House of 1926. He furnished it with antiques and modern furniture with impeccable taste. Both of Howard's books have been reprinted and new editions are available. The Galveston book is even available in paperback. The Vassar Place apartment complex in Houston was one of several projects Howard designed and built for investment. He purchased the site in 1962 with two apartment blocks already on it. The Barnstones in their chapter wrote, quote, Vassar Place floats above the ground over a series of projecting volumes. It reflects Howard's integration of nature and architecture and the automobile and architecture, unquote. The semicircular building allowed for a small green space at the entrance of each apartment, an interior courtyard, and a communal garden in the rear. Howard retained a three bedroom unit at the center for his office from 1974 to 1979. Howard's last residence was in this apartment where he moved after selling the Staub house. We'd like to thank Ben Hill for this uh, particular image at the top right and others in the book that he graciously donated to us. We had him running around Houston at the last minute to take these pictures and we really appreciated it. Howard committed suicide with an overdose of sleeping pills on April 29th, 1987. His last major bipolar episode began in 1985. He first experienced a months long manic period in which he was baptized and confirmed in the Episcopal Church in June, 1985. In November, 1986, he remarried Gertrude so she would have his health and retirement benefits after his death. At that time, he had entered a crippling depression during which he became calm, subdued, and rational. He repeatedly spoke of being in pain and experiencing a constant sense of foreboding. Barnstone's funeral was in the Rothko Chapel where hundreds of people stood outside unable to fit in the small chapel space inside. A burial service was conducted by the very Reverend J. Pittman McGeehee, Dean of Christ Church Cathedral at the time at Forest Park East Cemetery, where in death, as in life, Howard provoked a scene. As those gathered at the graveside began to disperse, his brother Willis Barnstone asked us to return and insisting that his brother had remained Jewish, prayed in Hebrew the traditional Jewish prayer for the dead. Howard Barnstone's death was the subject of articles in numerous newspapers, including the Houston Post and Sight Magazine seen here, the New York Times, the Texas Observer, and Progressive Architecture. The publication of Making Houston Modern attests to the fact that almost 35 years after his death, Howard's architecture is remembered and he is still missed. Thank you. Good evening, does everyone see me? Uh, I'm uh, speaking from Chicago. I'm not sitting in the beautiful Crown Hall designed by Mies, but in my office across the uh, field. Before I begin this uh, brief discussion about how and why Howard Barnstone looked to Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson to imagine a magical modernism for Houston's humid and hot climate, I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to Barry and Stephen, who have been generous collaborators, as have the rest of the contributing authors to Making Houston Modern. This past year, Ben Nicholson, a former faculty member at UH, and I brought, with the contributions of Stephen Fox and Nancy Manga McCaslin, 
another long-term project in conclusion with the publication of our avant-garde in the cornfields, architecture, landscape, and preservation in New Harmony, a study of the patronage of Houston-born Jane Blaffer Owen. So although I've been away for just over six years, I've continued to collaborate with former UH and Rice colleagues. To all of them, some of whom I hope are listening behind their computer screens this evening, I owe a special thank you for all that you taught me about the Lone Star Estate. I hope sooner than later, we will be able to celebrate these two books with overflowing margaritas. I would also like to extend thanks to the leadership of Preservation Houston, AIA Houston and Houston Mod for their willingness to come together and co-sponsor this event. In the years since I've moved to Chicago, I've become a hands-on preservationist, so to speak, because of the work of my, uh, together with my partner, Serge Ambrose, who currently chairs Docomomo Chicago, and I have done with our 1939 Modern House by architect Winston Elting. Through this process, I had grown to understand that in order to really make scholarship matter, architectural historians need to work closely with preservationists and advocates. There is nothing worse than writing about buildings only to stand by passively as they deteriorate, or worse still, they are torn down. During the English architectural critic Rainer Banham's last visit to Houston to write about the recently completed Manil collection by Renzo Piano with Richard Fitzgerald, he observed the interrelationships among three generations of architects, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, Philip Johnson, and Howard Barnstone, who all left an indelible mark on modern architecture in Houston. Banham writes, and I quote, Locally, the echoes are of Mies van der Rohe, which may sound strange, but one should remember that next to Chicago itself, Houston must be the most Miesian city in North America. Quite apart from Johnson's work for the Demonel St. Thomas connection and Mies' own extension to the Museum of Fine Arts, there is also the work of Howard Barnstone himself, Anderson Todd, and a small host of their pupils, partners, and followers almost everywhere, it seems, in the rambling, unzoned dystopia that makes Houston an urbanist nightmare, one may stumble with relief on neat, steel-framed structures with Made at IIT written all over them. And as often as not, the exposed I-beams of their exteriors are painted white against their gray walls." End quote. Here we see Piano's Manila collection with Miesian echoes and Mises' Cullen Hall completed in 1958 the color photograph taken by Hendrik Blessing, uh, Chicago's premier modernist photographic studio, whose collection now resides in the Chicago History Museum, shows the white steel structure and the signature buff color brick. While Mies made his graphite black painted steel a signature for his urban buildings, it is worth recalling that with the Farnsworth House in Plano, and with the McCormick House in Elmhurst, both completed in the suburbs of Chicago between 1951 and 52, and both now open to the public, the steel was painted white. Dirk Lohan, Mies' grandson who lives in Chicago, personally shared with me that Mies once told him that he used graphite black for buildings in cities because they were bound to get covered in soot, whereas buildings surrounded by nature could afford to be painted white. Perhaps the adjacency of Herman Park persuaded Mies to opt for white for Cullinan Hall, despite the urban setting. Piano seems to pick up on the Cullen Hall white paint uh, steel, even though by the time he arrived to work with Dominique de Menil, it was long replaced by the graphite black of the Brown Pavilion completed in 1974 after Mies' death. Together with Mies' Cullinan Hall and Brown Pavilion, Philip Johnson's Dominique and John de Menil house seen here, completed in 51, the same year as the Farnsworth, and the University of St. Thomas campus, realized between 1957 and 59, represent a radical intervention into the cultural and domestic fabric of Houston, reflecting Miesian tectonics, materiality, and spatial clarity. An aura of cosmopolitan elegance and glamour associated with Miesian architecture stood in contrast to ordinary buildings of developers and the writing architecture of McKee and Camera. This intervention signals shifts in post-war modern architecture as young U.S. trained architects translated the experiments of European modernism to significantly different political and cultural frameworks, as well as climatic contexts. Over the past decades, city-focused scholarship have made obvious that despite the travel 
the so-called international style architects like Johnson and Barnstone himself inevitably adapted or translated what they learned. The University of St. Thomas shares a piecemeal strategy remarkably similar to that of the IIT campus. Both campuses were designed for existing neighborhoods and both were the result of a work in progress approach that led to buildings being uh, realized over time. But what makes uh, them remarkably different is that Johnson eschews the Miesian strategy of using buildings to create loosely bounded exterior spaces, in the IIT case, landscape by Alfred Caldwell, by opting for a classical UVA-inspired quad and an ingenious two-story open-air balcony that frames and connects the buildings at the ground and upper floors. I will say that despite how much I love being on the IIT campus, my memories of the uh, University of St. Thomas open air sort of living room are still quite vivid. The adaptation to climate, despite the fact that these buildings were fully air conditioning, could not be more obvious in the uh, tall buildings and the details such as sun shading elements and brisolets that began to define Houston's skyline in the late 1950s and 1960s, such as the tentacle building seen here in a beautiful photograph by Ezra Stoller and the Americana building by Kirk and Associates. And you see, even in the Stoller photograph on the left, uh, a sliver on the right-hand uh, side of the Americana building. A Little bit of fun and uh, material culture for you. The architects uh, of these tall buildings seem to have adopted the intuitive shading strategy that cowboys and oil men knew long ago as they purchase their seasonally specific Stetson hats. Emblematic of Barnstone's translation of Miesian architecture is the Barbara and Alvin M. Owsley Jr. House of 1960, designed during the Bolton and Barnstone partnership for a lawyer and his family. It reproduces the steel frame and glass walls of Johnson's glass house completed in 49, but in a three-story spatial configuration. Significantly, the steel is painted a pale yellow as seen here in a Bethlehem Steel advertisement. This is one of the many demonstrations that Barnstone was hardly an orthodox interpreter of the Miesian legacy. Built on the bank of the Buffalo Bayou, the house's site possesses more topographic variation than is customary in flat Houston. In place of the free plan of the glass house, Barnstone substituted a compartmentalized spatial organization adapting the glasshouse farmer to requirements of family with three children. The only free plan space in the Owsley house is a double volume living room. Barnstone further translated Johnson's Miesian practices by adopting the outdoor walkways of the University of St. Thomas to completely surround the perimeter of the Owsley house, which Barnstone likened to the decks of a 19th century Mississippi River steamboat. Asked to summarize the challenges of the commission, Barnstone stated, and I quote, the problem was to search for a form which would make the glass box an easily adapted solution to the near tropical sun exposure, waterproofing of doors and openings, an extremely difficult problem, even in our age of superb synthetic waterproofing mixtures and the problems of night lighting and breaking through the glass barrier. Currently the house is abandoned due to damage suffered in a series of hurricane related floods. And you can see the, from the left to the right, two beautiful interior shots, and then a kind of the state in which it is currently. In an essay entitled Neoclassicism and Modern Architecture, the architectural uh, historian and critic Colin Rowe, who spent some time in Austin, uh, discusses and illustrates Barnstone and Bolton's De Moustier House of 1955, demolished sadly in 1995, an example of a Miesian architecture displaying neo-Palladian overtones. To the left is a wonderful slide photo, slide, color slide taken by Andy Todd shortly after the house was completed. It was subsequently donated to the Rice University Library and scanned and made accessible. These are one of the fun discoveries while doing the book and, uh, and the great possibilities of uh, web research. This is a perfect example of why color photography reveals much more than black and white in terms, in this case, of the buff brick and white uh, painted steel as a direct uh, nod to Mies. 
A period photo published in Look magazine on September 21st, 1965, shows Howard and Gertrude Barnstone in the living room of the Lois Lassiter and John Mayer house, completed in 64 and uh, now extensively remodeled. Built in the Homewood section of River Oaks, the house in the photo by Douglas Jones conveys an aura of cosmopolitan elegance. Even the choice of furniture is not a conventional Mies uh, aesthetic. Barnstone, much like Paul Rudolph's approach espoused in his seminal essay, Regionalism in Architecture, published in 1956, 57 rather, sees the process of translation as one that does not involve copying. Barnstone's approach to design can be read as a, reflecting a deeper existential condition formed by his social identity as an outsider, as a Jew, and as a man who struggled to define his sexual orientation. Barnstone was a relentless experimental modernist who developed architecture in response to the tangible and intangible spaces of his adopted city. He translated Miesian architectural ideas to Houston's brand of mid 20th century American liberalism, the local subculture in which he found his friends, associates, and clients. Perhaps because of his acute awareness of his outsider outlier status, Barnstone excelled as an architect of domesticity displaying a rare ability to relate to and interpret the psychological and spatial desires of his clients. Here, a period photo of an elegantly dressed woman posing in front of the entrance of the Nina Cullinan House of 1953 by Cowell and Newhouse speaks volumes about the association of Houston's elite with Miesian modernism. The Todd House completed in 1961 by Anderson Todd for his family uh, located on Shadow Lane, Shadow Lawn Circle rather, was described by Johnson as more Mies than Mies because of its rigorous conception and execution and its material and spatial amplitude and precision. Barnstone was infinitely more playful than Anderson Todd. He espoused Miesian cosmopolitanism while eschewing the Wrightian organicism associated with the uh, McKee and Camrath whose extraordinary Cynthia Woods and George Mitchell house seen here on the right built on Teal Way uh, was unfortunately demolished. The story of Howard Barnstone is very much the story about the impact that the University of Houston's College of Architecture made upon the city. Ironically, the very same school that gave modernism to Houston uh, moved from a modest one-story modernist building to Johnson's postmodern homage to Ledoux. However, in Johnson's defense, having spent eight years of my life as a user of this building, I must admit that while it is no crown hall, the multi-story atrium is a wonderful uh, social space. Finally, to close, with a nod to the Houston-Chicago dialogue that I have had the good fortune to experience personally, it is worth recalling the introductory paragraph of a life article published in 1957, and I quote, across the US from New York to Texas, a stern but stunning new architecture has begun to tower on city horizons, boldly rectangular with skeletons of steel sheathed in sheets of glass. It is the inspiration and accomplishment of one of the greatest architects of the 20th century, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. My new book about Chicago, Modern in the Middle, Chicago Houses 1929 to 75, seeks to further extend the conversation about translating Mises architecture by different generations of architects exemplified by the extraordinary trajectory and accomplishments of Howard Barnstow. All of these stories are interesting, but none nearly as interested as Howard Barnstow himself. Thank you. At this point, I hand the uh, mic over to my dear colleague and friend, Stephen Fox. Thank you, Michelangelo. Hi, Stephen Fox. I will address Howard Barnstone's late career work of the 1970s and 80s. This photo of Barnstone, published in 1982 in Houston Home and Garden Magazine, is how I remember him, conservatively dressed, dignified in composure, but rocking back and forth with barely suppressed mischief, probably because he's about to deliver some sly, outrageous, subversively funny pronouncement. Barnstone's sensibility, his keen observations and intellect, 
mischievous humor, and spatial genius are borne out in the buildings he produced after returning to practice in 1970, following his divorce from Gertrude Barnstone and the dissolution of his partnership with Eugene Aubrey. Marty's specialty store in Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas, Mexico, from the early 1970s, embodies Barnstone's spatial spontaneity. You see from these drawings in the Houston Metropolitan Research Center's Howard Barnstone collection, the big idea image on the upper left, then below it, the perspective by Barnstone's associate, Anthony E. Frederick, with the Volkswagen Beetle, and on the right, a planned drawing of the main stair. The irregularity of the stair is provocative. It defied common sense, which Barnstone loved to do, and would have transgressed municipal building and safety codes had it been built in the United States. But the stairs' wide, shallow, platform-like steps function like an ascending stage, not only for moving between floors, but also for the display of merchandise. I snapped this photo on a dreary, rainy winter day, but overcast skies could not dim the exuberance of Marthys, nor the effervescence of its colorful displays, attesting to the special sensibility Barnstone shared with his client, Marty Franco, who was also his stepmother. Barnstone designed and developed two sets of townhouses on a block in Houston's museum district in the early 1970s. Like Barnstone, these townhouses present themselves to the street in a subdued manner, but as you see in section, they are full of spatial surprises. The dining room and kitchen uh, in the left part of the house are stacked on top of the garage. The dining room overlooks the two-story tall living room on the right-hand side of the drawing. There are two bedrooms on the third floor and then a hidden attic nestled under the peak of the roof. Paul Hester's photos capture the sense of spatial surprise, including the secret rear garden toward which the two-story tall living room looks out through a wall of glass. In 1972, Barnstone was hired by Doreen and Frank Herzog to remodel a flat-roofed modern house in Memorial, designed in 1956 by another well-known Texas modern architect, Frank Welch. Barnstone and Tony Frederick reorganized the small house in the woods as a sequence of surprises, which began at the front entrance. They added a new glass-walled wing to the small house to become the new living room. The old living room became the dining room. Because of the addition of this new wing, the dining room lost its windows. So Barnstone and Frederick introduced a concealed skylight. You can see how it highlights the back wall and a counterintuitive interior glass wall to construct sensations of layered openness in the otherwise very simple and very transparent house. As Barry Bradley writes in her chapter on Barnstone and the Menils, Barnstone got two big late career commissions from Schlumberger, one on which he worked with Ted Gupton, began as a series of additions to a set of very mundane office and laboratory buildings at the Schlumberger Doll Research Center in Ridgefield, Connecticut. In the section drawing at the bottom of the image, you see that Barnstone's concept was very simple. He clipped two-story extensions with sloped glass curtain walls, the, the dark-toned uh, outer edges of the drawing, to the existing building, uh, which was rendered in white. Because, as you see in the top photo, he advanced and recessed the angled two-story glass bays in plan. The formerly prosaic wings acquired jewel-like facets that play off the sloped topography of the site. Barnstone's word for this sensation, magic. Barnstone, with the Austin architect Alan Nutt, also stepped a complex of apartments down a sloped site on West 6th Street in Old West Austin near Swedish Hill. Barnstone designed this condominium project, the Encinal, for his brother, Marty Franco's son, Robert Barnstone. In their essay in the book, Deborah Asher and Howard's nephew, also named Robert Barnstone, described the delightful spatial intricacy of the Encinal. The result of Howard Barnstone's skill at choreographing movement, both on foot and in a car, 
between and through buildings as one moves up and down the Ensenals Hill. In the 1980s, Barnstone embraced the postmodern critique of modern architecture, which he had resisted in the late 1970s. In this large, stucco faced, tile roofed, patio centered house for Nancy Geerling and George Peterkin Jr. of 1983, Barnstone seemed to be engaging the 1920s Palm Beach architect Addison Meissner. Yet, the romance is actually embedded in the plan where roofed arcades subdivide the site's open space into a sequence of courtyards, serene and soaring interior spaces designed by Herbert Wells of Houston, open through walls of glass to a voluptuous exterior of sunlight, greenery, and swimming pool blue. Barnstone described this effect as Pompeian. Barnstone's last house, the Holmes House in Beaumont. Barnstone's first built house is also located in Beaumont, which was designed with Rudolph Colby, plays with postmodern shapes and patterned brickwork, and what looks to me like Barnstone's salute to Taft Architects of Houston. In the early 1980s, Barnstone and his associates, Roger Dobbins and Edward Rogers, produced a design for the Webb County Administration Building in Laredo, Texas, uh, that did not get built. The mid-rise office building was capped by a huge dome that, as you can see in the upper left drawing, repeats the profile of the caps on Alfred Giles's adjoining 1909 Webb County Courthouse. That's the little three-story building on the far left of the upper left-hand image. Barnstone's postmodern tower was to be clad entirely in dark glass. This aerial perspective displays Barnstone's gift for spatial imagining. In this design, Barnstone complemented the distinctive Spanish colonial urban scale of downtown Laredo with a proposed network of tree-lined pedestrian concourses that sought to tie both his administration tower as well as the small historic courthouse into the fabric of downtown Laredo. Barnstone's last building, completed after his death in 1987, was the Schlumberger Austin System Center, on which he collaborated with Austin architect Robert Jackson and landscape architect Robert Anderson. The complex of buildings occupies a dramatic site atop a ridge, looking out across a wooded valley. As you see in the plans, interior space was distributed in a series of buildings, carefully fitted to the topography of the site. These buildings are linked by wide roofed passageways that Barnstone called the Broadway. Light, air, space, and greenery predominate. The architecture of the complex, which is now the campus of Concordia University, is self-effacing. Howard Barnstone was a big personality, yet he and his associates consistently designed buildings that impress with their intimacy, spontaneity, intuitiveness, and transparency. Barnstone's former student and eventual partner, Eugene Aubrey, asserts in an interview published in the book that Barnstone had an instinct for always doing the right thing architecturally. Howard Barnstone's buildings bear out the accuracy of Jean Aubrey's observation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen and Michelangelo and Barry. A great presentation. You got a, a lot of information. It's a wonderful effort uh, and achievement, and um, thank you for presenting it tonight. Um, it seems that we've got time for a few questions, if you will. And if anyone has uh, not yet sent in a question or would like to uh, make a comment, please do. We'll be watching those as we go on. But um, while Stephen is warmed up, I'd like to start by asking, um, I think among us, you are the one who um, uh, worked in Howard's off Howard Barnstone's office for some time. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And can you tell us uh, what it was like then? What was in the office? What was the what in the, what period of time was that? And and what was what all was going on in the office while you were participating in that? Well, I worked for Howard from 1977 to 1979. But important uh, uh, proviso is uh, I I didn't actually work in his architecture studio. I was helping him uh, with the preparation of the manuscript for the John Stahl book. So while the architects were upstairs, uh, this was at the Vassar Place Apartments, uh, I was downstairs in the carport 
uh, which uh, Howard had installed a glass garage door, which he also loved, and uh, uh, air conditioning. So it wasn't as bad as it might seem. But uh, it was a, a great experience, and mostly uh, because I got to work not only with Howard Barnstone, but with John Staub. And they were such um, uh, intriguing and contrasting personalities, sort of two uh, generational ways of looking at how to pursue architectural practice. But working with Howard Barnstone, uh, although sometimes it could be trying, I mean, H Howard could be difficult, but it was always incredibly stimulating because he was so imaginative, so funny, and always came up with these uh, uh, extraordinary uh, insights and, and perspectives on issues. So uh, uh, as, as much as sometimes might uh, lose patience with Howard, uh, at the same time, you always wanted to go back the next day just to find out what was going to happen. <laughs> who else who might be listening tonight uh, was in the office at the time? Well, uh, Ted Gupton, uh, who uh, uh, Ted tells me that he is uh, uh, summering in New Hampshire, so I'm sure he's uh, listening in great comfort. Sean McFarland, I actually see Sean is, uh, has a chat up uh, right now. Uh, Sean was then a, a student at the uh, University of, of Houston. Um, Tony DeSuno, Robert Jackson, Robert Morris, uh, uh, quite a few very talented people went through Howard's office. And indeed, I think one of the things that makes Howard's practice so extraordinary was his uh, great skill in hiring very talented people. So I'm gonna stay with, stay with you, Stephen. You're not off the hook yet. There's a, there's a question of curiosity about uh, whether or not you're in a Barnstone house right now. Well, it appears that I am, <laughs> thanks to the miracle of Zoom. Uh, uh, in, uh, I guess, two years ago, uh, Houston Mod was able to have an afternoon event at the, the Mayor House by uh, Barnstone and Aubrey on Lazy Lane. Uh, you saw the photograph uh, in Michelangelo's presentation of Gertrude and Howard standing in the living room of that, that great space, that wonderful glass-walled room ceilings 14 feet high that looks out over the, the uh, floodplain of uh, Buffalo Bayou. And it is uh, the same kind of uh, surreal experience that Michelangelo was describing in the living room of the Owsley House. You're in this sort of beautifully appointed room uh, uh, looking out uh, through glass walls uh, and of course uh, being in the air conditioning uh, to the wild nature beyond. A question about the partnership between Howard Barnstone and Preston Bolton. Uh, what was the duration of that partnership? That lasted from 1952 until 1961. And uh, uh, a question I really like from uh, uh, Lindsay Duhon for each of you uh, speakers, you co-editors. Uh, so we'll move on to Barry. I'll start with you. A question about, uh, would you tell us uh, your personal favorite building of Howard's or an aspect of a building that's uh, that's particularly special to you? Some part that sparks your personal interest, maybe a discovery in all this work you've done. Well, so much of Howard's work is uh, not extant. I, I got fascinated with his New York work, um, but a lot of that has just been destroyed because uh, his house there, the Meniel's house there that he worked on, um, is now part of a boys' school and that sort of thing. I think the Gordon House in Houston, partially because it's been preserved and it really is, it, I appreciate that. And I think it's, it's in Bracewood. Um, didn't Michael Ansel, you, did you show pictures of the Gordon House? No, I didn't. No, I, didn't. I don't know if Ryan Gordon is listening. He, um, but I think that's probably one of my favorites. The Gordon House is in wonderful and nearly original condition, and, and the present owners uh, treasure it and have been very generous with uh, letting us uh, preservation types in on a uh, on an occasional basis, so that we can uh, so that we can enjoy it together. It's it's fantastic. We used a contemporary photo of the living room in the in or, uh, the inner cover of the book, so we uh, you know that's an important. Uh, you know, stewards of modern houses are almost equally as important as uh, the architects themselves. You know that uh, with all your good work for Houston Mod. 
So staying with the same question, uh, uh, Michelangelo, you've got, you had a little time to think about it while Barry was answering it. A, a favorite Barnstone building or a revelation maybe from, the, from your research here? Well, I think the Owsley House uh, for me, because of its, uh, you know, its quirkiness and it's as Stephen described it as a bit surreal. Um, and so I, I think that it shows that you can have a sort of lineage but you're not necessarily uh, sort of paralyzed by that lineage and you're willing to kind of take it and uh, explore in different directions. And I think uh, that's what makes uh, the sort of lesson of architecture continually interesting for different generations. And as you, as you showed tonight, it's, um, it's in structurally sound condition and um, it's on splendid acreage as it always was. So um, hopefully, um, a preservation-minded owner will find their find their way there. Um, it's waiting for that. Um, and Stephen, we'll stay with the same question. Could you pick a uh, favorite? Well, it, it is the the house that is on the uh, back of the dust jacket of the book, uh, the I. H. Kepner House in River Oaks of 1969 by Barnstone and Aubrey. It's a house that is again very subdued on the exterior. But when you walk in, you're blown away. And Mrs. Kempner once told me that, that Howard uh, persuaded uh, she and Mr. Kempner uh, to not narrow the entrance hall. I think it's about 10 feet wide. And the house is not tremendously big. But she said that, that Howard told her that um, they would always treasure the kind of spatial amplitude of that wide room. And it leads uh, to a glass wall living room and dining room at the back of the house. It's really just one single space uh, that contains an extraordinary collection of art, but also looks into a backyard, which Howard planted out as though it were a dense forest to, to, to in fact, disguise uh, how close the house is to the back property line. So it, it is a house in which uh, Howard and Jean uh, kind of solved all of these spatial problems uh, with the kind of excess of imagination. And it's a house that, that uh, I, I kind of really feel Howard's personality in, but in part because he was so responsive to the personality of the owners. Could any of the three of you say something about the culture of Houston uh, in terms of its influence on uh, Howard Barnstone's practice and uh, those of his contemporaries, perhaps? Stephen, that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> well, um, Howard Barnstone, of course, particularly because he taught at the University of Houston, had a, a tremendous uh, impact upon uh, generations of architecture students. But I think, you know, what kind of stands out when you compare Howard Barnstone to uh, uh, McKee and Camrath, the Wrightian Ar Houston architects that we talked about, uh, Anderson Todd, his sort of fellow Nisian architect, and an architect we, we didn't mention, John Zimonic, who was also his colleague at the University of Houston. Those three architects were all uh, very much associated with certain ways of designing buildings, whereas Howard, through the course of his career, uh, his, his sort of sense of style changed. And Jean Aubrey makes the point in uh, the interview in the book that that was because Howard kept uh, recruiting these sort of talented people and really drawing on their interests and their preoccupations to influence uh, the evolution of his design. So Barnstone, uh, it's intriguing that it's more in sort of subjective ways that I see his influence, the way in which he uh, influenced the, the people around him uh, from Burdette Keeland, his student and his lifelong best friend uh, to, to um, architects who are much younger, the way in which they almost modeled themselves on Howard because he was such a kind of persuasive model of, of cool. Um, and, and the impact of some of his architectural details, and we mentioned in the book, Howard thought the light switches should not be at shoulder height on a wall. They should be aligned next to the uh, uh, doorknob. And so that was a detail that other architects in Houston really picked up on. So you could go through all of these Houston houses and always see that the light switches are down at the doorknob level, and you realize that's the Howard Barnstone touch. 
Stephen, if I may interject too, I think that um, Barnstone's constant experimentalism uh, was much unlike Mies as it was like Philip Johnson's approach, um, and, uh, or at least similar to a kind of uh, attitude of constant uh, questioning and experimentation as opposed to refinement of a few uh, items. So I don't know if you agree with me or that on that point. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, we've got, got a few more questions of a technical sort of uh, nature uh, or design nature, but, um, but maybe a couple of personal notes. Now, I've got one from an anonymous attendee I'd like to read um, for her. It says, I had the great privilege to grow up in a barnstone, ho barnstone house on the bayou. It was a bit like being Tarzan in his treehouse, looking out on the semi-tropical wilderness across the bayou of Memorial Park. We spent much of our childhood, like Huck Finn, exploring the banks of the bayou. Saving the Owsley House should be a priority. It's a magical setting, would make a great public building, if not a private house again. So I think she's agreeing with you, Michelangelo, that um, this is something we should, uh, we should work toward. We'd like to hear now from a um, little technical leap here, so we'll hope this works, but uh, Gabriella Barnstone is with us tonight. And um, if she is unmuted, we'd uh, love to have a story from her, please. Hi there, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, well, I thank you so much for putting this together. This is really, really wonderful. And um, there are a lot of Barnstones, I think, on this. <laughs> on this um at this session i just wanted to share a quick story because it's it's really fixed in my mind and um i think everyone who knows howard will appreciate it so you know of course he was my favorite uncle and um he uh you know we used to send uh well he called them chain letters to each other which meant that he would write me a postcard and then um and then i would send him one i would i would take i would write a postcard and tape my postcard to his postcard and then send it to him and then so on and so forth until there was a big accordion of postcards. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we just kept adding on. But the, the, the story that I wanted to tell was that there was a big hurricane in Houston and uh, I was a little kid and my family came, went to go visit the, their family, um, my cousins. And, and um, so there was huge fallen trees all over the streets and debris everywhere. And uh, we got there and, you know, I was the youngest uh, girl, two older brothers. So I was always trying to tag along with my brothers, much to their chagrin. And I think that he, you know, just noticed that, picked up on it. And he had a golf cart and he gave me the keys to the golf cart, which meant, you know, it was just electric. I could, I mean, I don't know how old I was. I was probably eight or something. Um, and I, he said, go. He just said, go and have fun. And um, I, you know, I, I, I drove around um, the, this, this crazy wonderland um, and I just will never forget it. And it, and it really, um, it really just uh, it, in a way just opened up a new perspective, you know, that I could have my own adventures. And, you know, that's just, that's the kind of guy he was. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, a question about Martis in Nuevo Laredo. Is it still in operation? Is it, is it still recognizable if we go visit? Stephen? Well, I, I, it's been uh, many years since I've been to Nuevo Laredo, but uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine who is from Nuevo Laredo said that the, the building is for sale. Uh -huh. So it's, it's still with us in any case? Yes. Good. Um, we... Uh, now, again, uh, through the miracle of Zoom, if uh, he's unmuted, Robert Barnstone is with us tonight. Uh, Robert, uh, are you here? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you, and we're hoping you, you had a story to share about sure. Howard Barnstone. Oh, there's plenty of stories. Uh, um, in, 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 the, uh, in, in 1979, uh, I, I worked uh, as an apprentice for, for Howard. Um, and, uh, and, and it was, it was a fascinating time because, uh, in a sense, this was, this was, a, you know, at the height of postmodernism and so forth. And, and one of the things, uh, uh, about Howard is that, uh, he never really, uh, thought that, uh, I mean, maybe in the sixties and 
so forth. He thought that modernism was, 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 was the bee's knees, but he was always changing his styles. And you can see this in so many of the projects that he's, he's, he's uh, um, built. Um, and, and part of that is, is the fact that modernism was too limited in the end. He was able to make these wonderfully magical spaces and he had certain techniques of the kind of, you know, the, the, the black lines, the brick infill, all of these things that were sort of learned from, from University of, 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 uh, of, 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 Hughes, uh, of St. Thomas and so forth. Um, but uh, um, I think some of his best buildings are buildings that uh, took on spatial ideas that were far more uh, complex and forms that were far more complex. And if we look at, say, the plans of uh, which we published, uh, the plans of the Highway Motel, which we published in, 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 in our chapter, you can see these curved walls, these totally um, uh, uh, non-modern buildings in the sense that, uh, or non-modernist buildings or non-Mesian non buildings um, that had incredible plasticity. And, and uh, if you look at the relationship between the rooms and the garden plans and so forth in these hotels, they're just incredibly complex and incredibly brilliant. Um, combining these sort of large scale window situations with these beautiful isolated little gardens that are tiny and beautiful. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, in the house that I grew up in, which was a renovated barn, um, it, it, uh, 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 took a, um, it, it took a traditional architecture of the barn and, and, and contrasted it against this vast modernist uh, um, uh, uh, glass wall. And it was, you know, in 19, it really, it was 1963 that he came down and, and ultimately the house was built in 64. But he wanted to do, he came in and he wanted to do a passive solar house with these modern um, um, systems because he had worked for the Demoniles sort of, you know, fixing Philip Johnson's problems with, with, with the Demoniel house, with, with the HVAC systems and, and so forth. And, you know, uh, Howard had an incredible sense of, uh, of how to, to, to work the mechanics and the detailing in projects. I mean, if we look at the, at, the, at, 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 at so many of these steel, um, Re, uh, uh, profile renovations that he's done. They're, they're, they're actually very, very technically proficient. And anyway, um, so in, 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 in doing uh, these, you know, the, all, 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 all of these, oh, sorry, I'm losing my, tra my, 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 my track here. I apologize. Um, but anyway, uh, um, he, I, I just, you know, want to say that, you know, working in his office, um, Howard was capable of drawing very carefully, uh, sketching, and he hired draftsmen to figure out the various kinds of angles and so forth. But he could sketch absolutely proportionally, and and you know, being his you know protege or whatever, when at, at that age when I was very very young, um, he would explain to me uh, how to use a scale. He would say, you know, he would he would very carefully rip off a sheet. He would tell me put the sheet down this way so that you can, you can draw over it, it curls into the, you know, and he would teach me all of these amazing things that were very old school um, kind of architectural notions. And he would, he say, you always draw with a scale, right? And, and he would, and he would constantly check everybody's drawings with the scale and so forth. So on, uh, and, 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 and again, as I mentioned in the article, he sent me off to uh, study with uh, structural steel uh, folks, so that so that I would really learn how to how how to draft, and uh, he he found it absolutely essential wow. that uh, that 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 one uh, uh, needed to be able to 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 do these things. Uh, anyway, um, it was a it, it was a fascinating time, and uh, I still uh, look back on those moments and uh, and uh, have have learned an, an immense amount. Uh, from Howard in that short period of time. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for sharing that with us tonight. And I, I see that indeed there are a lot of barn stones um, with us tonight, and that's that's fantastic. We were hoping for a big turnout uh, and from the family, and 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 we've got it. Thank you. And one of the things I see is that Marty is with us tonight. 
So yeah. that's a special treat. And um, we're, we're very happy about that. Uh, back to, to maybe Howard's, well, I don't know. I was going to say to Howard's earlier work. Uh, Stephen, we've seen uh, early Barnstone projects in uh, uh, East Texas. The qu we have a question as to whether or not he ever uh, designed any projects in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, let's see. Uh, I know that Howard uh, considered uh, some possibilities for uh, projects in the lower Rio Grande Valley, but uh, I don't think any of them got built. No, L L Laredo and Nuevo Laredo was sort of more his uh, axis along the border. I'll mention that the book has a, a one of the great things about it is it's a thoroughly document do, thoroughly documents the work of the office of the offices I should say uh, of Howard Barnstone built and unbuilt work. So a, a lot of those questions are answered and he been within the the book. Um, I guess I'd mention here that uh, the forward by Carlos Jimenez is, uh, is is a wonderful thing. As is the afterward by uh, Teo Prudhomme. It's um. It's a, it's a very well crafted book and also enjoyed the uh, contributions of Bruce Webb talking about the the early days of the U of H College of Architecture and when he was there, when, when Howard was there, when those early administration and profs were there. Uh, a question I like about uh, wonder, something wonderfully uh, unique or Houston-like Houston about uh, Howard Barnstone's townhomes in particular. Uh, Maybe you could speak, uh, one of you could speak to what set them apart from what we see uh, going up all over the city today. Um, well, for one thing, they had glass garage doors and a glass interior wall uh, between the garage and the entrance and stair hall so that when you were in your house, you could uh, look to, lovingly to your garage and admire your car. That's how much Howard Bardstone loved cars. He wanted the cars to live with you. <laughs> I think one of everyone's favorite photos is the uh, the Renault convertible. Is it a convertible? The Renault uh, Roadster that uh, Howard and Gertrude are uh, are posed in front of. Um, I don't know how long he had that car, but um, I'm sure I'm sure it was um, I'm sure it was a lot of fun. Well, Steve, you, you asked about Howard Barnstone's influence on other people. And one person that I think of in particular, who is not an architect, is, is the artist Michael Tracy. Uh, they were uh, great friends. Uh, Howard was an early supporter of Michael Tracy's. And of course, Michael Tracy's art uh, is, is extraordinarily intense. Uh, Michael um, and his colleagues I think uh, ha have been inspired to embrace architecture and uh, along the border uh, uh, in San Ignacio, Texas, about 30 miles down river from Laredo, where uh, uh, Michael Tracy and the River Pierce Foundation have acquired um, these wonderful stone houses of what is really the most Mexican town in Texas and have done a, a, an extraordinary job in bringing them back to life. Um, I hesitate to use the word restoration because it's something more sensitive and more personal. And I, to me, that, that is a kind of link between Michael Tracy's sensibility, uh, Howard Barnstone's sensibility, and Marty Franco's sensibility. Is this ability to kind of infuse their work with uh, a strong subjective presence? Um, Danny Samuels has chimed in uh, that the Grouse Stark Milford townhomes, townhouses were three on a 50 foot lot, so 16 by 100. And that, that can't, uh, can't happen anymore, but uh, unfortunately, but which is true, it's about density as well, what we see going on around town. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, Barry, and Michelangelo um, for a great presentation tonight and a, and a great achievement with the book. We have, uh, I've jotted down. Michelangelo's promise of overflowing margaritas. And I think that was a commitment to a book signing, um, having it downtown at the new um, Architecture Center, Houston would, uh, is a great goal. Hopefully we can do that next year. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. And uh, of course, thank you, Jim, and my friends and collaborators, Stephen and Barry. And uh, we can do a sort of a reciprocal 
sort of uh, an equivalent to margaritas here in Chicago uh, uh, as, uh, at some point too in the, our lives will, as they will shortly, I hope not uh, within a year or so, return to normal. So wonderful. Back to you, Jim. Well, um, I mean, <laughs> what can I say? But but thanks to all of you. Um, we have a lot of things coming in by chat, and and I would echo those. Um, the yeah. the authors all did a fantastic job. Steve, you fielded the questions expertly. Um, amazingly, we were able to get Zoom to work so that people who we couldn't even see could talk to us. So I, I consider it a win. You know, nothing nothing blew up. Um, and uh, the the um, coordinator who you can't see is Jennifer Ward from Architecture Center Houston, who I also want to thank. She did a lot of the logistical work and has been um, <laughs> behind the scenes um, responding to people's concerns and, and helping people with their audio and things. So Jennifer, um, thank you so much for being there too. Um, a, a reminder to purchase uh, Making Houston Modern from Brazos Bookstore if you're in Houston or from your favorite local bookstore if you're elsewhere. Um, and just one more reminder, we're very happy uh, that Preservation Houston was able to partner with Architecture Center in Houston Mod on this event tonight. Just to remind you again, um, look all three organizations up online. Uh, we would love to see you at our future programs. And I will also say we're all nonprofits. So your membership and your donations make a big difference to us too. So uh, if you like what you see here tonight, explore what else we do and we would love to see you again. If anybody else wants to chime in with anything before I close it. Thank you. Thank you for all everybody who watched. We had a good, good showing. We did. We, we had almost 400 uh, between Zoom and YouTube. So I think that's pretty fantastic. It really does show there's a lot of interest in this topic. Thank you. And it, half of those were Barnstones. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that just leaves me to say thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, I hope we'll see you again soon. And uh, have a great night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.